Greetings, welcome back to Black Bear News where we are discussing abrupt climate change and um, as always, lots to cover. Uh, someone asked me um, a while back to talk about the emotional um, aspect of abrupt climate change. And I feel like I, I feel like I kind of do already um, spend maybe not a lot of time, but some time <clears throat> on that subject. Um, I have in the past, obviously talked a lot about it, but um, I was thinking about the emotional aspect or the idea of being in the doomosphere. Um, I mean, what exactly is the doomosphere, right? Like it's, to me, it's people, <clears throat> people who live in a, you know, the world of like, um, climate, you know, Armageddon or climate change, uh, abrupt climate change, climate doom, economic doom, peak oil, uh, you know, what else, the nuclear, nuclear doom, um, you know, people who are tied in or clued into um, the idea that, you know, we're, we're going downhill quickly while everyone else is, you know, it's business as usual. There's a, <laughs> there's a quote from a song from a band I've been listening to. And the quote, uh, the, it's like a sample. And the sample is, uh, avalanche is above, business continues below. And it, like every time I hear it, I just, that's, you know, I feel like there's an avalanche of, of a doom, um, going on uh completely unawares to most people and um it's just an interesting thing to be a part of i <clears throat> clearly um people who are talking about this uh, especially in the abrupt climate change world like you know it's not that you're it's not that you're nutty like it's one thing if you're a conspiracy theorist or somebody who you know, lives in, and you know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, you know, admittedly someone who my, my bias is towards the idea that, um, I do believe that the powers that be are willing, able, and doing everything that they can to keep themselves in power and to, uh, keep whatever it is that they have um, in their grasp um, and they are willing, willing, able and capable and have and are currently doing um, all kinds of nefarious things in order to keep that power. Um, I'm, I'm firmly in that camp. Um, that is my bias and but I try to not let my bias get in the way of actually finding evidence. You know, I don't think obviously not everything is a conspiracy but not every conspiracy is false. So um, if you have that outlook or that uh, viewpoint, you could possibly parse information a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> but it's not just being about being a conspiracy theorist or somebody who's, you know, I, I feel like the doomosphere on some level is a little more tied to evidence. So it makes it, you know, makes it even more doomy than conspiracy theorists, right? Peak oil people and economic, economic doomers and peak oil doomers and climate doomers. They're really actually just looking at, you know, charts and graphs and, you know, mathematical equations and um, all kinds of studies. You know, it's a lot of uh, journal lit literature. It's a lot of, um, you know, just things that scientists or economic scientists or, um, or what have you have looked, you know, looked into, done studies on, made projections, and this is what, you know, it's going to be looking like. Um, so the doomosphere is, you know, I don't know, I, I, I would imagine that it's quite, it, it encompasses a lot of things, but um, 
if you're in the climate change doomosphere, um, <clears throat> it can make it can make you really lonely, right? Um, that's the you know the the basic the first takeaway I get is that you are um, shunned by normal people. Like if you start talking about this stuff or you are looking into this th stuff and you're worried about this stuff, um, you know, people who are in the business as usual world are like, please stop harshing my vibe and would you go away and would you be quiet, please? Um, and it can really ruin relationships. Um, and it can make it very hard to connect with people and it can make it very hard to function as a regular person because you now you know this thing um, that you cannot stop looking at. You know, you can't unsee it. Once you see it, you cannot unsee it. And you can't just, it's almost impossible to just be like, well, you know, whatever, everything's gonna be fine or I'm just gonna, you know, carry on as normal. Um, even though, you know, most people I think do a pretty good job of doing just that. Um, there are climate journalists, scientists, people that, you know, they, they have lives, they are trying to live their lives and trying to, um, be fulfilled and, um, have meaningful relationships and, um, do meaningful work and, you know, to do all of that stuff with the knowledge that all of this is for not is um, incredibly, incredibly hard. And I'm sure very painful at times um, emotionally, but um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm feeling, or I have been feeling since I started this channel, the very um, kind of paranoid idea that people just, it's too much for people, right? So because this is too much for people, I am too much for people. And um, on some levels, you know, uh, people are looking at me askance, you know, and possibly like, okay, that guy um, is way out there. But I also think that, you know, people see the truth and they see what it is. They see that it's not, it's not, uh, a fairy tale it's not <clears throat> it's not an imagination um, it's not a concoction it's it's too real for people to look at so you know they really you know they just don't want it in their face and you know so I understand like when when uh, people on this channel are like I gotta check out or I gotta take a break or you know, I don't know what to do with this. I don't have anybody to talk to. Um, those are all very normal feelings. And um, I don't know what to do with that feeling. You know, um, myself, I think that I, I'm just, I'm busy. I'm busy doing life things. I'm busy doing the things that need to be done. And sometimes climate change gets in the way of those things. Get, you know, the thinking about climate change gets in the way of getting those things done. Get it, getting it, it gets in the way of just just living life. You know, um, and it's difficult because if you know about climate change and you know that every single thing that we do, the way that we live, the paradigm in which we inhabit is um, all of it is wrong. All of it is terrible. All of it is destructive. All of it is leading towards a very very um horrible end um so yeah it's hard to get it's hard to get motivation about doing that it's hard to have um a real uh, you know real faith and uh, and feel good about you know going forward and doing regular things it's you know um i'm constantly in like two or three mind frames all day long, you know, all the time. Like, okay, I have to work and make money. I have to take care of my kids. I have to buy food. I have to go to the store. I have to make sure that, you know, everything is um, 
in my world is, you know, running smoothly. And that requires me to be fully engaged with industrial civilization. Um, and at the same time, knowing all of this is a terrible, terrible way to be and a terrible way to continue to try to live. I have to do it. So I do my best at it. Um, but I think also the, you know, the, the fact that I'm not totally invested in it obviously has its, um, leaves its mark as well. You know, um, I do my best at anything that I do, but you know, if you're, if your heart's not in it, then people are going to understand that they're going to feel that they're going to, they're going to know at some psychic level that you're like just playing a game and and that right there will 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 set people off. It will you know um, drive people away. Will make people wary. Will make people not you know feel like something is off. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't have much too much more to say about this at the moment. I'm just I'm just rambling about what it is um, that this means, and a lot of times. Lately, I kind of feel, you know, this distinct urge to just not really worry about it anymore. Just do, you know, do life things and, you know, whatever maybe may be. I don't know. Um, that's also a constant debate in my head. Uh, not lately, actually, for, for a long time. For the whole time I've been doing this channel, I'm like, why am I doing this channel? Well, I have to do this channel. I have to talk about this with somebody. I have to, um, you know, I, I, I know and I see what's going on and I have to acknowledge it in the world or I will lose my mind. Um, that's why I'm doing this channel. But, you know, a, another part of me doesn't, doesn't see the point um, since we're going where we're going. Um, that's it. You know, there's cycles. You cycle through emotions, you cycle through thoughts, you cycle through energies, you cycle through, um, good days and bad days. You cycle through whatever it is that you have to deal with in your everyday life. Um, we're all doing that. And, um, I don't know. I don't have an answer. I don't have a, a magic wand and I don't have a, a crystal orb and I don't have, I don't have anything like that. I just have uh, um, kind of just terrible knowledge and uh, a desire to at least go forward in the world positively. I don't know. I don't know much more than that. But anyways, <clears throat> let's try and get some climate change. <clears throat> Excuse me. News. Happenings. What is happening? Um, there's a new Arctic news blog out today, Sunday, August 19th. Will August 2018 be the hottest month on record? July and August are typically about 3.6 C or 6.5 Fahrenheit warmer than December and January. August is typically 1.8 C or 3.24 Fahrenheit warmer than average annual temperature above image shows how much higher the temperature was for selected months compared to the annual global global mean for the period 1980 to 2015. Uh, will August 2018 be the hottest month on record? <clears throat> and by this graph, it's looking, uh, it's looking so. Numerous temperature records have fallen across the world recently, heat stress, Hazard is high under conditions of high surface air temperature and high relative humidity. When looking at heat stress hazards, it's therefore important to look at surface air temperatures over land, i.e. the temperature of the air above the land surface. Fire hazard is high under conditions of hot and dry, dry soil and strong winds. When looking at fire hazards, it's therefore important to look at, at land surface temperatures, <clears throat> reflecting how hot the surface of the earth would feel to touch in a particular location. The map below shows land surface temperatures. Um, and lots of red, lots of heat, 
Glacier National Park is very hot. Columbia, Alberta, hot Idaho. <clears throat> when calculating how much warmer it is now, a number of things must be taken into account. One, baseline, what baseline is used and how is the temperature at the baseline calculated? In the image at the top, the baseline is 1980 to 2015, which is a very recent period. When using a pre-industrial baseline, anomalies could be more than 0.6 C higher than when using 1951 to 1980 baseline that NASA normally uses. <clears throat> surface temperature, two, surface temperatures or surface air temperatures. Above map shows land surface temperatures. As said above, this is different from surface air temperatures over land that show the temperature of the air above the land surface. Similarly, sea surface temperatures indicate the temperature of the water at the surface. Sea surface air temperatures, on the other hand, are slightly higher. They are measurements of the air temperature just above the surface of the water. NASA typically uses surface air temperatures over land uh, while using surface water temperature over oceans. When instead using air temperatures globally, the uh, temperature anomaly could be more than 0.1 C higher. Three, missing data. How are missing data dealt with? To calculate the global mean on maps, NASA uses four zonal regions uh, and fills gaps in a region by the mean over available data in that region. In data sets, however, missing data are typically ignored. This could make a difference of 0.2 C. Ignoring data for the Arctic alone could make a difference of 0.1 C. Depending on how the above three points are dealt with, the temperature in August 2018 may well be more than 3 C above the mean annual global temperature in 1750. The question is whether August 2018 will be warmer than August 2016, which was 2.3 C warmer than 1980 to 2015. By the way, remember the Paris Agreement? When politicians pledged to take efforts to ensure that the temperature would not cross 1.5 C above pre-industrial. And that is that. <clears throat> Short and to the point. Oh, I see. August, August 2016 was uh, 2.3 C. Okay, it's showing... It's not showing 2018 <clears throat> yet being above 2016. Not yet. Uh, moving on, revisiting um, this red tide going on in Florida. <clears throat> Um, so they're, they're actually linking this to warmer waters, um, ergo climate change. How climate change is making red tide algal blooms even worse. Washington Post, uh, from a few days ago, Florida's toxic red tide prompts state of emergency. Governor Rick Scott declared a state of emergency in seven Florida counties on August 13th because of a toxic al algae bloom. Continues to kill, kill marine life in the state. <clears throat> August 15th, red tide is killing Florida's southwest coast. Fish, manatees, sea turtles, some of them, them endangered, and nine dolphins have washed up dead on beaches. Um... There are several ways human activity can exacerbate a bloom, but the main culprit is allowing nitrogen-rich materials such as fertilizer, fertilizer to run off into natural water sources. I heard somebody talking about this, that it was big sugar that was making this happen. Uh, agriculture, basically. The same fertilizer that helps sugar cane. Uh, Tomatoes and corn grow in the sunshine state, feeds, feeds algae when it reaches the ocean. Humans are also playing a role by driving up global temperatures via greenhouse gas emissions. In a letter published by the journal Environmental Science and Technology, researchers at the University of Florida and the University of North Carolina said that climate change will severely affect our ability to control blooms. In some cases, 
in some cases could make it near impossible. As air and ocean temperatures increase, the environment becomes more hospitable to toxic algal blooms in several ways, according to scientists at the Environmental Protection Agency. Warmer water and fresh water, such as the Great Lakes, a different kind of algae, uh, cyanobacteria, flourishes at warmer temperatures. Combined with fertilizer runoff, red tides due to uh, cyanobacteria have spiraled out of control in recent years, particularly in western Lake Erie. In freshwater cases, the harmful algal bloom doesn't just threaten wildlife, it also threatens the water that people drink and bathe in. In 2014, Toledo's water supply was so poisoned with cyanobacteria toxins that the entire city had to drink bottled water for three days, according to the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Global ocean temperature has risen about two degrees since 1900. Maximum annual temperature in the eastern Gulf of Mexico has also climbed about two degrees since 1977, according to buoy data. I said buoy before, guys. I wasn't saying buoy. Uh, buoy data collected by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. K. Brevis, the algae affecting Florida, has an interesting response to rising temperature. It thrives in water temperatures up to about 83 degrees, but if it gets much warmer than that, the algae, algae doesn't grow as quickly. However, researchers have found that K. brevis can tolerate higher temperatures and grow faster, given more carbon dioxide. Atmospheric carbon dioxide surpassed a concentration of 400 parts per million in 2015, and will continue to rise as society burns more fossil fuel society. Extreme rain events wash more fertilizer into the ocean. For the eastern United States, 2018 has been the year of floods. <clears throat> Interesting, because 2017 was pretty floody. Week after week, torrential downpours on saturated ground have pushed rivers and streams beyond their banks. What doesn't get caught in reservoirs or absorbed into the ground eventually reaches the ocean, carrying all of the minerals, pollution, and nutrients picked up along the way. If torrential rain happens to flood regions with heavy agricultural production, the runoff tends to be high in fertilizer, chemical, or manure. In either case, it's liquid gold for coastal algae. More shallow water along the coast. Average sea level across the globe has risen seven to eight inches since 1900, according to the 2017 National Climate Assessment, a significant portion of which has occurred since 1993. Relative to the ocean levels in 2000, scientists project about another point Five foot rise by 2030, up to 1.2 feet by 2050, and as much as 4.3 feet by 2100. Even the low end of the projection calls for one foot by the end of the century, which is more than enough water to push more than enough to push water into areas that it hasn't inhabited in at least a couple of millennia. As places such as Tampa, Miami, and Charleston, South Carolina lose shoreline, the ocean gains more shallow, warm water along the coast and a larger area highly favorable breeding ground for algae. More CO2 equals more plant growth. Like land plants, algae breathes in carbon dioxide and exhales oxygen. The more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the more the plant can grow and multiply. Rapid growth is possible with higher levels of CO2. It's the gas of life, right? Especially toxic blue-green algae that can float to the surface of the water, according to the EPA. Droughts lead to saltier freshwater. One of the effects of climate change is more precipitation extremes in both directions in some parts of the world. Droughts will become more intense and prolonged. Without rain to replenish lakes and ponds, the water becomes more saline or salty as it evaporates. If it gets salty enough, algae that typically only grows in the oceans will invade freshwater systems too. There you go. Um, moving on to something I've been wanting to read. This is from carbonbrief.org. Methane uptake from forest soils has fallen by 77% in three decades. The amount of methane absorbed by forest soils has fallen by an average of 77% in the Northern Hemisphere over the past 27 years, a new study finds. The research, which analyzed soil data 
taken from more than 300 studies, suggests the world is currently overestimating the role that forest soils play in, in uh, trapping gas. The lead author tells Carbon Brief. Um, this reduced uptake of methane by soils is likely being driven by increases in soil mo moisture as a result of enhanced rainfall, the author adds. In wetter soils, the bacteria that breaks down and store methane are less able to function, he explains. The discovery <coughs> means, that <coughs> means that methane will accumulate much faster in the atmosphere, another scientist tells Carbon Brief. Methane matters. Methane is a greenhouse gas that is 34 times more potent than CO2 over a 100 year period. We know this, meaning it has a powerful short term effect. The largest source of human caused methane emissions is agriculture, particularly from livestock and rice production. The second main driver is fossil fuel production, which allows underground methane to escape into the atmosphere during the drilling, extraction, and transportation process. Oops. On top of this, methane is also released by several natural processes, including from the activities of wetlands, melting permafrost, and freshwater lakes. However, the release of methane is largely offset by other natural processes which absorb methane from the atmosphere. The troposphere, the lowest level of the atmosphere, is the largest sink for methane. In this part of the atmosphere, methane reacts with naturally occurring compounds known as hydroxyl radicals, to form water and to a lesser extent, CO2. Down on the ground, soils <laughs> they form CO2. Uh, down on the ground, soils, particularly forest soils, play a smaller but still significant, significant role in absorbing methane. These soils are home to the specialized bacteria known as uh, methanotrophs, tropes, methanotropes, uh, or trops, I don't know literally meaning methane eaters. The bacteria absorb atmospheric methane that has diffused into the soil and break it down into smaller compounds that they can use as energy. However, the activity of these microorganisms appears to have slowed dramatically in the past three decades, says Dr. Peter Grothman, a microbiolog uh, micro mi microbial biologist, uh, not a microbiologist, a microbial biologist, and co-author of the research published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, scientists, he tells Carbon Brief, our an analysis of meth methane uptake around the globe shows that methane uptake in the forest soils has decreased by an average of 77% from 1988 to 2015. We conclude that the soil methane sink may be declining and overestimated in several regions across the globe. Um, yeah, saturated soils to determine the cause of the reduction in soil methane uptake. At the two, two study sites, the researchers looked at the range of factors known that are known to impact the activity of the methane eating bacteria. They found that uptake has decreased despite recent increases in air temperature at both sites, which is thought to boost bacteria activity. The researchers also found that in both regions, Rainfall has increased over the past three decades, likely as a result of climate change, which has caused soil mo moisture levels to increase. As soil moisture increases, less methane is able to diffuse into the soil from the atmosphere, Brofman explains. Uh, the researchers found that across the northern hemisphere, areas that have seen a decrease in soil methane uptake have also tended to experience local increases in rainfall. <clears throat> The findings show clear evidence that the size of soil methane sink is decreasing as a result of increased rainfall. Beleaguering budget. The findings suggest that the global methane budget, the balance of emissions and uptake of methane across the Earth's surface, will need to account for a decrease in soil methane uptake. This is not good. Saturated. Um, is the operative word it's completely saturated the oceans the soil the trees uh I did, somebody just post something about the fact that the trees are actually releasing carbon now i think they did <clears throat> and i can't remember who it was i'm sorry if i'm i believe it was a comment somebody just left
Yeah. Well, somewhere in here. Um, the trees are no longer a carbon sink. I think it was Void that left a comment about this. Trees are no longer a carbon sink. So um, even if we planted trees, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the effect of planting, you know, millions of trees would be in the long run, but they're not, they're not absorbing carbon like they used to. The basic takeaway. And just following up, um, I, mean, I probably won't read the whole thing, but just headline of, you know, more fun with the Trump administration, new Trump power plan. Plant plan would release hundreds of millions of tons of CO2 into the air. Um, it's from the Washington Post. I believe, I don't know. Oh, I just got this out of, uh, out of my email today. President Trump plans this week to unveil a proposal that would empower states to establish emission standards for coal-fired power plants rather than speeding their retirement. A major overhaul of the Obama administration's signature climate policy, the plan which is projected to release at least 12 times the amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere compared to the Obama rule over the next decade, comes as scientists have warned that the world will experience increasingly dire climate effects absent a major cut in carbon emissions. Trump plans to announce the measure as soon as Tuesday during a visit to West Virginia, according to two administration officials who spoke on the condition of anonymity because the White House was still finalizing details Friday. The Environmental Protection Agency's own impact analysis, which runs nearly 300 pages uh, projects that the proposal would only ma uh, make only slight cuts to overall emissions by pollutants, including carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxides. Over the next decade, the, the Obama rule, by contrast, dwarfs those cuts by a factor of more than 12. The new proposal, which will be subject to a 60-day comment period, could have enormous implications for dozens of aging coal-fired power plants across the country. The EPA estimates that the measure will affect more than 300 U.S. plants, providing companies with an incentive to keep coal plants in operation rather than replacing them with cleaner natural gas or renewable energy projects. By 2030, according to administration officials, the proposal would cut CO2 emissions from 2005 levels by between 0.7% and 1.5%, compared with a business-as-usual approach. Those reductions are equivalent to taking between 2.7 million and 5.3 million cars off the road. By comparison, the Obama administration's clean power plan would have reduced carbon dioxide emissions by about 19% during the same time frame. That is equivalent to taking 75 million cars out of circulation and preventing more than 365 million metric tons of carbon dioxide from entering the atmosphere. Uh, yeah, well, this is definitely a, in the wrong direction, definitely in the wrong direction than we want to be going. Does it make, um, you know, I hate to say that this doesn't make a difference in the outcome. It's just in the wrong direction, that's all. I mean, whether it makes a difference or not. Uh, we don't want to be doing this. We definitely don't want to be doing this. I'm going to link all of these articles below. I mean, the Trump administration is also, you know, giving away wildlands and opening up the Arctic and you know, blah, blah, blah. They're just, I, you know, um, the unfortunate thing is this will probably help the economy in the short run, um, which is terrible because this creates more fake, you know, economic uh, strength or whatever, you know. This makes people feel like, you know, for a little while, like, yeah, 
America, we're on track. Um, you know, apparently, you know, supposedly we have 4% growth this year, which is, you know, idiotic uh, on so many levels because, you know, obviously that means, you know, great things for the economy, but just terrible things for the environment and terrible things uh, in the sense that it keeps, you know, fueling the, the idea that, you know, a, a growing economy is, is good for people in the long run, which it is not. And if it's all based on outdated and outmoded uh, technologies and keeping like an old system alive, like eventually that old system is going to fall apart real, real bad. And, you know, we're back where we were and even in worse shape than, you know, on top of the fact that we have, you know, trillions of derivatives floating around. I don't know what's happening with that. Uh, it doesn't seem to, you know, the debt is, ballooning the derivatives or ballooning the debt is you know personal and national debt is skyrocketing none of these are good things um pumping up the military and just doing all the things that we're doing is you know another reason to join the doom sphere and you know, live the good life um that's all i have for you tonight thank you so much for your eyes your ears and your conscience if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so at the links below. Until next time, peace.